All right, we'll go ahead and get started. Uh, hello and welcome everyone to the first of the Discovering Our Ancestors and Preserving Historic Grave Sites webinar series, Understanding Site Ownership and Access to Grave Sites. My name is Mary Fernandez and I am a Program Outreach Coordinator for the National Trust for Historic Preservation. Uh, the National Trust has prioritized the preservation of historic cemeteries through several, several initiatives and programs, uh, including through grant making, the HOPE Crew, and other forms of advocacy like our work at Chaco Bottom and through America's 11 Most Endangered Historic Places, including Olivewood Cemetery in 2022, Morning Star Taber Tabernacle Number 88, Order of Moses Cemetery and Hall, the Indigenous Burial Sites at Rossowick in, in Virginia and at the West Berkeley Shell Mound and Village Site in California in 2020, uh, the Ancestral Places of Utah, which was in 2019. And as many of y'all know, uh, the needs related to preserving historic cemeteries is enormous. Uh, and the National Trust is committed to continuing to provide resources and tools to address that need, uh, such as this webinar series, uh, as well as an in-person event this fall, coordinating with our annual Pass Forward Conference in Washington, D.C. I would like to say that everyone has a cemetery, uh, whether it's one they love or one that is the final resting place for their loved ones. Uh, I myself came to be passionate about cemeteries due to my professional background in museums and historic sites. Go to the next slide, please. Thanks. Uh, so uh, most recently, before joining the National Trust, I served as the Director of Special Events, Special Projects and Volunteers at Historic Oakland Cemetery in Atlanta, Georgia. Uh, I'd also like to introduce my co-host for today, uh, Mr. Jason Church. Jason Church is the Chief of Technical Services at the National Center for Preservation Technology and Training with the National Park Service. And Jason divides his time between conducting in-house research, organizing various training events, and teaching hands-on conservation workshops. Uh, Church is currently the conservation chair of the Association for Gravestone Studies, um, and he is the one of the best people to know uh, in the field of cemetery preservation. So Jason, if you'd like to hop on. Hey, thanks, Mary. Uh, so welcome everybody today. Uh, as Mary said, my name is Jason Church. Um, I'm with the National Center for Preservation and Technology and Training, and we're a National Park Service Research and Training Office located in Natchitoches, Louisiana. And I've been here working uh, in our cemetery preservation efforts for 18 years. The center has been uh, working with cemetery preservation longer than that, um, and we're we're super excited to have you all join us. Um, and you know, Mary threw her her hat in how she got involved. I will say I got involved in cemetery preservation in a third grade North Carolina history project uh, where I did a walking video tour of Oakdale Cemetery in Wilmington, North Carolina, and I've been hooked ever since. Uh, so I'm really excited that you're going to join us and please, yeah, we've got two more webinar series that we're going to be doing. Uh, we're really excited to uh, to share what we are passionate about with you. Thank you so much, Jason. That's fantastic. Uh, and if you'd like, we can air that third grade uh, tour of the cemetery if, uh, in one of the future webinars. I actually have a digital copy of it. <laughs> <laughs> um, so in case y'all didn't know, Preservation Leadership Forum, where this webinar is being hosted, is the professional membership program of the National Trust for Historic Preservation. Uh, this webinar series is made possible by members of Preservation Leadership Forum, and we sincerely thank those of y'all who are with us today. Uh, before we begin, here are a few technical logistics. Uh, we will take questions from the audience throughout the webinar. Uh, please send questions via the Q&A function directly to panelists. Uh, you're welcome to submit at any point during the webinar, but we will be waiting until the Q&A section to answer questions. Uh, you are also encouraged to communicate to all participants you know, throughout, through the chat function. Uh, the closed captioning function is enabled for this webinar. Uh, following the program, we will be sending out a recording of today's webinar directly to the email you use to register. Uh, you know, I encourage you to please share the recording with your colleagues working to preserve their historic cemeteries. Uh, and, you know, please also feel free to introduce yourself uh, and your cemetery in the chat and let us know what future topics or tools you'd like to see. Finally, uh, all forum webinars are archived in our forum uh, webinar library. 
Uh, and without any further ado, if you'll go to the next slide, please. I'd like to introduce uh, our panelists today. We're joined by Christopher Cody with the National Trust for Historic Preservation, Pam Bowman with the National Trust for Historic Preservation, as well as Everett Fly from Everett Fly Associates. Next slide, please. First up, we have Christopher Cody. Christopher Cody is Associate General Counsel for the National Trust for Historic Preservation, working in the area of legal advocacy. Prior to the National Trust, Mr. Cody was a Deputy State Historic Preservation Officer for the State of Arizona and Manager of Advocacy and Staff Attorney for Historic Charleston Foundation in Charleston, South Carolina. Uh, Chris, if you'd like to take it over. Thank you very much, Mary. Uh, next slide, please. Let's begin with a very brief overview of the legal framework for burial sites and cemeteries, followed by a discussion of legal issues and federal law. So burial sites are a special type of real property, and there's an important distinction I'd like to make right off the bat. Although we may refer to any real property containing human remains as a burial site, all burial sites are not cemeteries. Instead, cemeteries are defined by state statutes that vary significantly from state to state. Statutory definitions of cemeteries often specifically exclude individual marked and unmarked graves and burial places owned by restricted groups such as families, religious organizations, or fraternal organizations. Individual state statutes and common law contain these relevant legal definitions and distinctions. Now, how the law deals with cemeteries and burial sites has been a concern since the earliest days of our country. The first Supreme Court case on the subject was all the way back in 1829. And the quote at the bottom of this slide from a 1926 case out of New York, I think well summarizes the law's respect for the dead and burial sites. The dead are to rest where they have been laid unless a reason of substance is brought forward for disturbing their repose. Next slide, please. Let's start our discussion of the legal framework concerning descendants' rights. First of all, and you will hear me repeat this throughout this presentation, the laws in this area vary from state to state. However, universally, descendants have legal rights connected to their ancestors' burial sites. These rights are not ownership rights, rather they're typically more akin to an easement in gross, which is a type of affirmative easement that empowers a specific individual or entity with a specific right. This notably differs from an easement appurtenant that attaches to the property itself, like an access easement where one property is the dominant estate and the other the subservient. The most common example of an easement in gross is a utility easement. Now, the way to determine whether or not any kind of easement exists on a piece of property is through a detailed title examination. Check with your local property records office to make sure that you've examined every possible piece of information about your property. And I know that other speakers are gonna to touch on this as well. Next slide, please. Let's now move to the legal framework for the private ownership of burial sites. While descendants do have the right to visit the burial sites of their ancestors, those rights are not unlimited. Again, this varies from state to state, but generally speaking, the owners of burial sites and cemeteries can require reasonable notice prior to a descendant visit and can also reasonably limit the hours open for visitation and even the frequency and duration of visits. I know that my colleagues are going to speak more about maintenance later, but to quickly touch on it from a legal perspective, first of all, many jurisdictions have no maintenance requirements for the private owners of burial sites. That being said, if they're neglected, they can potentially rise to the level of being a nuisance if they diminish the value of neighboring properties. Lastly, in some cases, private property owners are willing to provide some public access to burial sites for non-descendants. The images on this slide are from the burial site of Johnny Ringo, who famously was a villain in the shootout at the OK Corral in Tombstone, Arizona. It's located in a remote area of southeastern Arizona, and the owners of the property, faced with public interest in the site, built a turnoff to help facilitate public access. As you can see from the before slide in the bottom left, the site is by a picturesque river. Unfortunately, the public began to abuse the site, leading to the erection of a sign establishing rules, which you can see in the center. And then finally, if you look closely at the image on the bottom right, the owners had to erect a fence all around the site to keep people from camping nearby and from hiking all over their private land and generally trashing the area. This is an example of the challenges of inviting the public to visit privately owned burial sites and the cost that the owners sometimes have to bear. Next slide, please. Let's now move on from the legal framework to legal issues, starting with relocation. Sometimes the owners of burial sites and cemeteries wish for them to be relocated, often to allow for redevelopment. This is usually possible if certain conditions are met. Now, I again have to, the most common condition is that the burial site or cemetery has to be abandoned. And now I again have to mention that this differs from state to state, uh, but let's look at Virginia's requirements as an example. 
to be considered abandoned in Virginia. There cannot have been any new burials for the past 25 years, and there has to be evidence that no one has maintained the site for a substantial time period. Virginia requires a court hearing for the relocation of human remains, and that hearing must include public notice. And while not required, recommended actions prior to a court hearing in Virginia include conducting a genealogical search for descendants, engaging an archeologist to determine the exact boundaries of the site, and contacting the State Historic Preservation Office to evaluate the site for historic significance. Next slide, please. Continuing our exploration of legal issues, let's now turn to the issue of intentional damage. Again, our favorite refrain is relevant here. It differs from state to state. However, the intentional damaging of a burial site is always a serious criminal offense. In fact, damage, damaging or relocating human remains is typically a felony. If you're concerned that a burial site or cemetery is potentially going to suffer damage, there are two important things you can do. First, notify the potential offender. Most of the criminal statutes tied to the damaging of burial sites and cemeteries require that the offender has the intent to commit the crime. A record of notice stating that, for example, an area slated for development has burial sites within it makes it more difficult for an offender to later claim that they didn't intentionally disturb human remains. Also inform all relevant state officials and local ones as well. You'll see in the image on this slide a newspaper article. It concerns a development project that included a historic cemetery outside of Charleston, South Carolina. In this case, in addition to the fenced map cemetery for white people, it was known locally that an African-American burial ground also existed just outside of the white cemetery's boundaries. In 2021, the South Carolina Department of Health and Environmental Control halted work at this site because of information that it had received in regards to those potential burials, demonstrating the effectiveness of providing notice to the appropriate state officials. Lastly, on this slide, you'll see an example of Virginia's law that establishes the disinterment or displacement of human remains as a class four felony. Again, this is a serious crime. Next slide. Let's take a look at some other examples of Virginia laws that deal with intentional damage. I, I find these two laws interesting. Now, please note there are exceptions to them for regular maintenance. So first, subpart one makes it a crime to remove, cut, break, or injure any tree, shrub, or plant within any cemetery. That's a very high level of protection. Second, subpart two also makes it a crime to damage or remove anything placed at essentially any burial site. See the expansive definition. Again, this is a high level of protection with criminal penalties. Lastly, these two laws show how cemeteries are typically treated differently than other types of burial places by the law, often afforded higher protections, even extending to their landscaping in Virginia. Next slide, please. Here's one more example of a Virginia law that deals with intentional damage to burial sites. This law makes it a felony to destroy, mutilate, deface, injure, or remove any element of virtually any burial site, explicitly including the fencing or railing around it. This again underscores the serious nature of any molestation of burial sites. The law clearly demands respect for the dead and for their final resting places with high fel felony penalties for violations. Next slide, please. Next, let's briefly discuss the legal issues surrounding the discovery of human remains or funerary objects. The statute on this slide is from Arizona and includes a couple important concepts related to discoveries. First of all, there is a virtually universal duty to report the discovery of any human remains, no matter the circumstances. In Arizona, the discovery of human remains, funerary objects, ceremonial objects, or objects of national or tribal patrimony must be reported to the director of the Arizona State Museum. Note that this particular law does not generally apply to private citizens on private property, but rather to state and local governments and permitted archaeological explorations. The director then has a responsibility to notify not only potential relatives, but also any groups or tribes that may have a cultural or religious affinity with the remains or objects, along with relevant academics and the state historic preservation officer. Next slide, please. This law includes the important concept of tribal notification. Arizona has 22 federally recognized tribes, and for many of them, the remains of their ancestors and associated funerary objects are highly sacred. As you can see from this statute, each tribe that wishes to receive notice of discoveries must keep on file with the director a geographic area and list of cultural groups for which they claim affinity. This is a very important concept as it relates to discoveries. Native American tribes historically often occupied different areas than they do now, and the area in which a tribe claims affinity can be far more expansive than you might expect. The evolution of cultural groups is also important. Tribes that today are unrelated can sometimes have common ancestors, which creates an interest in the remains or objects associated with those ancient ancestors. Next slide, please. 
The concept of tribal notification and respect for tribal remains and objects is enshrined in federal law. The federal law that provides these protections is NAGPRA, first passed in 1990. NAGPRA establishes federal protections for Native American burial sites, human remains, and cultural items, and both civil and criminal penalties for violations. It requires federal agencies and some recipients of federal funds to undertake notification and repatriation efforts. And for more information, the National Park Services Service administers the National NAGPRA program. You can see a link to it on this slide. I encourage you all to, to look to that for more information. This is a very complex law. And many states have state level laws that echo NAGPRA, like the Arizona law that we just reviewed on the previous two slides. Next slide, please. Finally, I'd like to end by bringing up section 106 of the National Historic Preservation Act and how it deals with burial places and cemeteries. For those of you who are unfamiliar, the NHPA requires federal undertakings uh, consider historic resources via the Section 106 process. Be aware that burial sites and cemeteries are not automatically considered historic resources for the purposes of Section 106. They must satisfy the criteria for listing on the National Register of Historic Places to be so considered. Now, there's a policy statement that's been adopted by the President's Advisory Council on Historic Preservation concerning burial sites in Section 106. There's a link to it on the slide here. And this is an excellent resource for understanding best practices as it relates to Section 106 and burial sites. And finally, I'd like to highlight some ongoing national trust work with Section 106 and historic burial sites and cemeteries, specifically at Shaco Hill African Burial Ground in Virginia and at Morning Star Tabernacle Number 88, Order of Moses Cemetery and Hall in Maryland. Both of these African-American burial sites are threatened by proposed transportation projects that require Section 106 review. And Moses Hall was actually previously damaged by a 1960s road project and was included on our 2021 list of the 11 most endangered places in America. So with that, I conclude my presentation. Thank you very much for your time. Thank you so much, Chris. Um, moving on to our next panelist, we are joined by Pam Bowman, who is the Senior Director for Public Lands Policy in the Government Relations Department at the National Trust, uh, where she focuses on uh, designing and implementing advocacy campaigns to secure passage of federal legislation. Pam has spent the last 20 years in Washington, D.C., deeply engaged in the legislative process, including working for two members of Congress on their legislative teams and for nonprofit organizations as an advocate and lobbyist. At the National Trust, her work includes uh, federal funding advocacy and supporting legislation that would permanently protect historic places nationwide. Thank you, Pam. Thanks, Mary, and hi, everyone. Um, thanks for joining the webinar today. I am going to briefly share with you some background on a future federal funding opportunity for the preservation community and those who are working to preserve African-American burial grounds. And we also have an opportunity to get involved in advocacy for federal appropriations to help support a new program. Um, next slide, please. The National Trust, along with our partners for several years, worked on the legislative effort to establish a grant program to preserve African-American burial grounds. Many of you uh, on this webinar may have taken action on our website in the past couple years to send letters to your members of Congress supporting this bill or joining us for uh, the virtual Hill meetings that we had last fall as part of our Pass Forward Conference. And thank you again to all those who got involved in this legislative effort. All of your support and involvement were instrumental in the success of this legislation. So in the last Congress, um, bipartisan legislation called the African American Burial Grounds Preservation Act was broadly supported in both the House and the Senate. And after the midterm elections, Congress needed to pass a large spending package to fund the government. And what we've seen in recent years is that other bipartisan bills often get added to those large legislative spending packages. So we were definitely thrilled um, when the legislative provisions of this bill were included as part of the fiscal year 2023 omnibus spending package that was enacted in December 2022, just before the holidays. And what this bill did, it, is, it established the National Park Service African American Burial Grounds Preservation Program by authorizing $3 million annually for five years. And this grant program will aid efforts across the country to research, identify, document, preserve, and interpret historic African American burial grounds. 
And another component to this legislation is that the Secretary of the Interior must engage in consultation with the National Trust and members of the African American heritage community in developing that grant program. So we are definitely looking forward uh, to collaborating with the National Park Service and others in implementing this new initiative. Uh, so while we're very excited about this legislative success and the new program, there's several steps between now and when the program will be operational. And as many of you know, federal funding and appropriations can be a lengthy process and everything happens in a particular order. So in the case for this bill and this program, it needs to be authorized, then the federal dollars need to be appropriated, and then the National Park Service would have the funds available to carry out the program. Uh, some of these programs uh, in the federal budget are only authorized for a specific period of time. And for example, this one is for five years. So one of the first steps that since this legislation authorized the appropriation, Congress is still gonna need to actually appropriate the money as part of the fiscal year 2024 appropriation cycle. And the great news is that we've already seen support for that funding um, early in 2023. Uh, back in March, President Biden's fiscal year 2024 budget proposal to Congress included the full $3 million to the National Park Service for the grant program. And several Senate offices have already led a letter to the Appropriations Committee in support of fully funding the program at $3 million. Uh, next slide, please. So this is definitely an opportunity for all of us to engage in federal advocacy over the next few weeks and months to show our support for fully funding the African American Burial Grounds Program. A big part of the government relations work at the National Trust is advocating for federal funding, including grant programs uh, that support the preservation and protection of historic sites and cultural artifacts nationwide. This includes developing resources so that we can collectively push for sustained federal funding. And here again on the slide is an ask that you can make to your members of Congress in both the House and the Senate. And that ask is to support full funding at $3 million for the new National Park Service African American Burial Grounds Program. We'll also add a link to the chat to our annual report called the Preservation Budget, Select Preservation Priorities for Fiscal Year 2024 Appropriations. And this is a report we share with Congress and the preservation community each year that recommends funding levels for various programs. And you'll see that it's a long report, covers a wide variety of federal funding issues, and you may find a number of other programs you're interested in supporting. Uh, but in terms of this program, there's a front and back page um, for the Burial Grounds Preservation Program, and that should be PDF page 25 uh, to read more about the details for that advocacy. The Trust Government Relations Team has already been in contact with our partners and champions on Capitol Hill about the annual appropriation, and we definitely need your support so that members of Congress are hearing directly from constituents about the importance of this community, uh, community program and what that would do for um, burial grounds throughout the nation. So whenever possible, when you're talking to the congressional offices about this program, Really share as much detail as you can about state and local examples that will resonate with congressional offices. Elected officials and their staff love to hear the personal stories and the histories of places they represent. And it really does make a big difference in giving context and personalization to the asks that you're making of that office. So we're hoping to secure another win on this issue with full funding for the program. And then the National Park Service will launch their process for designing and creating the new program. And one of the best ways for you to get updates on when that funding is secured uh, and when this program launches is by signing up to receive our monthly government relations email newsletter, if you don't already receive it. Um, here's where we share updates throughout the year on federal advocacy, opportunities for you to get engaged, and also upcoming dates for grant application deadlines. And finally, um, I'll briefly mention um, something about NAGPRA. Uh, the previous presenter, Chris Cody, spoke about uh, NAGPRA, and I wanted to briefly mention there's occasionally opportunities to engage with congressional offices about the law and its implementation. In the House, the Committee of Jurisdiction is the House Natural Resources Committee, and in the Senate, it's the Senate Energy and Natural Resources Committee. And there's often hearings and other bills and legislation that get introduced throughout the year. Um, and this issue is often mentioned during their deliberations, and they're generally good committees to follow if you're interested in learning more. 
And I'll also drop a link in the chat uh, to one of our partners, the National Association of Tribal Historic Preservation Officers, who have a page dedicated to NAGRA and the advocacy work that they've done. And it shows some pretty good examples um, of advocacy opportunities that arise around NAGPRA, um, in addition to some of the other links that have been shared um, from the National Park Service about the background uh, of that particular law. And I will stop there. Thanks, everybody. Thank you so much, Pam. Uh, moving on, we are we are joined by Everett L. Fly. Uh, Fly is a San Antonio native and resident, a licensed uh, landscape architect and an architect. He has more than 40 years of national experience preserving historic black towns and settlements. He is a fellow of the American Society of Landscape Architects. Awards include the 2014 National Humanities Medal, 2020 Conservation Society of San Antonio, Texas Hero of Preservation Award, 2021 Daughters of the American Revolution Historic Preservation Medal, uh, and the 2021 Harvard University Graduate School of Design Distinguished Alumni Award. Thank you so much for joining us today, Everett. Uh, thank you, Mary, for um, having me. And um, I wanna thank Christopher and Pam for really uh, setting up the stage of the uh, the ordinances, the policies, the guidelines uh, that uh, you would come in contact when you're dealing with a historic cemetery. Um, I understand that it might seem like very overwhelming, uh, but um, there are ways that you can uh, gradually work your way into uh, uh, documenting and uh, understanding the, the kind of resource that you have. And then of course, as uh, Christopher and Pam pointed out, uh, there are regulations, definitions, um, criteria uh, that you have to match uh, as you go along. So I'm going to try to um, highlight uh, some of those and see if I can tie some of the strings together uh, for the for the participants. Um, one of the things that uh, both of them, <coughs> excuse me, pointed out um, is, <coughs> excuse me, that the <coughs> just a second. Excuse me. That that the the uh, burial grounds um, may not uh, be uh, clearly defined, and so what we have to recognize and understand is that many of our burial grounds are what I would call vernacular in nature. In other words, they they don't follow a a, a, a geometric grid. They don't follow a particular stylistic pattern. Um, they kind of evolve organically um, in our American landscape. Uh, so next slide, please. So I'd like to start just by setting out some uh, thoughts of uh, you know, how do you document and how do you verify uh, the context for ownership, the, the airship of ownership, and uh, as Christopher did a good job pointing out, ownership itself. Um, one of the things that I've learned in working with these resources is that uh, the context, the physical as well as the cultural context, um, uh, might give you a lot of clues. And, and that's what you're working for is to uh, build up as many clues and uh, pieces of documentation as, as possible. Um, genealogy would seem like an obvious um, uh, strategy and an obvious approach. Uh, family genealogy, including oral history. But uh, one of the things that I've learned is how important uh, community genealogy is. And I'll give you a couple of um, examples. Um, it may not seem that um, oral history is, uh, you know, really possible with some of these um, um, older cemeteries. But uh, again, one of the things that I've learned is that um, the the stories and the experiences have been passed on from one generation to another. And uh, if you take a little bit of time to sit down, um, uh, either with some of the folks or some of the representatives of um, religious congregations or organizations. Uh, you'll find out that somebody has a little thread of information, a little clue, a piece of information that that will give you a clue. Uh, and then documentation, of course, is always important. Uh, uh, deed description a lot of times can be found. Um, uh, it's tedious to go through those deeds, but um, I'll show you an example in a moment uh, where there was actually there's actually a mention of a deed, and then of course um, a survey. 
And the survey can be um, prepared by a professional certified or licensed surveyor, but there are things that you can do uh, uh, starting out uh, with your kind of the preliminary investigation. Um, and, and I'll talk about that. Uh, next slide, please. Of course, here's an example of a family genealogy. Uh, this is a genealogy chart, and this family is looking to see uh, who's related to whom. Uh, but uh, one of the things, uh, uh, as pointed out, I think Chris did a good job. Um, and one of the things that I've learned is that um, families um, can be quite extended. And uh, there may be, in a uh, seemingly a family plot, there may be some neighbors that are buried. There may be uh, some folks from completely different parts of the community or different parts of the county uh, buried for different uh, cultural reasons. Um, so um, when you're working with family genealogy uh, connected to a cemetery, uh, I would suggest that you try to find um, as broad of a genealogy as possible and look for as many different connections uh, as possible. Uh, the next slide, please. Here are two examples of, uh, of uh, what I'm talking about when I say community genealogy. Uh, these are two um, newspaper articles that I just wanted to show you as an example. I'm not expecting you to, to read the articles, but um, the one on the left is uh, uh, June 8th of 1900, and it's uh, appeared in the, the Waterbury Evening Democrat uh, newspaper in Connecticut. And it explained that uh, uh, prominent family, Mr. and Mrs. Clarence Mackey, uh, were building a home and uh, discovered that there was a Negro cemetery. And the Mackeys purchased uh, uh, land and made an arrangement for the bodies that were buried in the cemetery to be uh, reinterred. Um, so there's several clues in here, uh, the Mackeys themselves. So you would be looking for the deeds related to the Mackeys. You would be looking for uh, that land that the Mackeys owned uh, when they made the purchase and discovered the cemetery, you would be looking, who did they purchase that land from? And what was the history connected to that, uh, that burial plot uh, and those folks? And then uh, connect that, for example, to your, to your uh, genealogy. Um, and then where was the, uh, the new burial ground or burial place uh, located? Um, the one on the right is uh, January 2nd, uh, 1914. Uh, in the, it appeared in the Riverdale Pointer uh, newspaper in Illinois. And uh, you can see there at the top, it says New Negro Cemetery. And it explains that uh, uh, the community of Thornton, Illinois uh, purchased land for a new Negro cemetery. And they assigned a name to that new cemetery. It was, called, it was to be called Mount Forest. And it also explains that uh, it says the deal was completed uh, at the Olivet Baptist Church. Uh, it gives the address uh, of the church. And then it says that the contract was signed by, uh, and it gives several people, Reinhold R. Hoke of Philadelphia and the Reverend E.J. Fisher and H.J. Kelly. So you'd wanna look, uh, look up all of those uh, folks and all of those addresses. You'd wanna look up the, uh, the church uh, religious congregation and see if you can understand what the connection was. And then what struck me, one of the things that struck me that was interesting is that uh, it mentions that uh, Reinhold R. Hoke was uh, from Philadelphia. So what was his connection, um, um, you know, in this story? Um, and of course, what you're doing as you're going along is uh, uh, building um, um, historic information and possibly a case for uh, historic significance. You heard Christopher um, in his discussion um, outline that um, every cemetery is not um, historic. Uh, you would have to have the, the background and, and the, uh, to explain the, the significance uh, in order to, to receive that designation. Uh, so you would have to do extensive, in either one of these cases, you would have to do extensive community uh, 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 research 
and uh, genealogy work to, to make those connections. Uh, next slide, please. Uh, a, couple of, uh, a couple of experiences I've had um, in more than one place. Um, and again, you heard uh, Christopher talk about uh, uh, public nuisance and that kind of thing, but uh, a number of cases I've come across uh, where cemeteries are, have been taxed and uh, the uh, families that received the, uh, the tax uh, bills were uh, uh, afraid to uh, get involved because they thought they would uh, you know, be liable for these taxes. And of course, this varies, as Christopher pointed out, uh, across the country. But uh, often, if you can find one of these tax statements, it'll give you the name of the person associated or related. So this may be an heir. Uh, that's related to this um, cemetery. It may be a trustee. It may be uh, a benevolent organization or um, uh, religious organization, but there are clues once again uh, in these kind of public records. Uh, the one on the right is a, a citation. Uh, again, Christopher mentioned this. It, the one on the right is a citation, code compliance citation for an overgrown cemetery. And again, um, when you read the fine print, uh, it gave the name of the person that was, or family that was uh, uh, supposedly uh, had custody of this uh, cemetery or property. Uh, and it gives you a way to, again, you're connecting the dots uh, and uh, uh, trying to determine that uh, uh, ownership or heirship um, uh, advocacy or whether somebody is just acting as an agent uh, for that piece of property. Uh, the next slide, please. Uh, legal description. Um, again, we assume uh, many times that there's, there's uh, no legal description for these uh, burial sites or cemeteries. Uh, but here's an example that, uh, that actually includes the meets and bounds, in other words, the, um, the length and the orientation of, of each boundary of this particular cemetery. Um, and I made a larger um, uh, image there on the right. Again, I'm not expecting you to read it, but I just wanted you to see how detailed it is. And uh, I did underline there in the slide on the right uh, where it says that this was set up uh, for a Negro graveyard. And it also, in the text of, of this deed description, it says that this, the other land surrounding this um, uh, graveyard was being sold, save and except for the Negro Cemetery. So they're not selling the cemetery in this, uh, in this transaction. And then it goes on to give uh, these detailed meets and bounds. Uh, again, the orientation of the boundary, uh, boundaries of the property, uh, the length of the uh, property, and uh, their relationship to other adjacent property lines. Um, if you can find a, a meets and bounds description such as this, uh, I mean, this is, as they say, this is a gold mine. Um, it's loaded with information that helps you connect uh, uh, not only the uh, genealogical dots, but the physical dots, you know, where these properties are located um, and how they related to, to other adjacent properties. Uh, next slide. And then, of course, what you're hoping is uh, is that if if you can gather enough um, public records information, you can come up with uh, a physical survey, land survey of the land uh, of the property. And even if you don't um, have access to a surveyor, uh, with our modern technology, there are things that you can do. For example, you can go out. Uh, many of us with our smartphones and record the latitude and longitude uh, locations. Uh, but in this particular case, it was a project that I was working on. Uh, we were able to get uh, a certified surveyor to uh, essentially donate this survey. And so you can see at the right, the, uh, the kind of uh, light gray line that shows the easement to the survey, uh, uh, to the uh, property. Uh, the, the green parcels represent the actual um, uh, uh, cemetery proper, uh, and 
and then the kind of blue and uh, 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 purple or pink uh, areas represent, there was a conflict in this particular survey. Um, the adjacent landowners had actually encroached into the survey uh, when this subdivision was platted. Uh, and by having a um, certified survey, uh, we were able to compare uh, the uh, subdivision track survey with this cemetery survey and determine that there was, there was actually an encroachment. Uh, we also used in this uh, particular survey, um, we, we also used um, old aerial photographs. Um, some of the photographs came from um, the transportation department, uh, say 1930s or 40s vintage. Uh, we used aerial, aerial photographs from the Soil Conservation Service. Um, and we also used um, uh, old land grant um, uh, records. Um, and all these were overlaid uh, to verify this survey. Um, and, and again, what you want to include is, of course, you want to include the boundaries, uh, the easements. You heard uh, Chris talk about the easements. Uh, whether they're utilities or access easements, um, whether there were any markers. Um, and again, you would be looking for vernacular markers. They're simple uh, piles of stones or simple um, uh, uh, hand-hewn stones, uh, topography and uh, vegetation. Um, I wanna go back and talk for a moment about the, the easements. Um, one of my observations in, um, uh, these vernacular cemeteries and older cemeteries across the country is that uh, many times the uh, the indigenous uh, burials, um, the uh, Asian American burials, the African American burials were not right on the roadway. Um, and this seems to be have been done uh, intentionally. Uh, so uh, don't assume that uh, the, the cemetery is right on the uh, uh, the main road or the main path, uh, it may have been set off away from the main road for uh, defensive purposes to protect the cemetery. Uh, the topography also plays an, another role um, uh, in what you're looking for. You, you want to be, again, uh, cognizant of whether it's, uh, it's on a rise, a high point, uh, a low point. Uh, many of these uh, cemeteries are on high on rises. In other words, uh, the folks understood the um, uh, you know the natural patterns of drainage and and even access and uh, place these carefully. And they don't always match uh, our modern um, uh, community and and urban layouts. And then of course uh, vegetation. Uh, you're looking. You want. Um, especially the larger vegetation, you want that included in your survey um, because what you're looking for are, um, uh, I think the National Park Service has a program they call witness trees. Uh, you're looking for um, uh, natural or uh, native vegetation that might have marked a, a corner or might have marked a um, location of a si significant family. Uh, next uh, slide, please. Uh, so again, um, by identifying these uh, physically, you're looking to build strategies for preservation, conservation, interpretation, commemoration, and maintenance. Um, you want to want these to all be as authentic as possible. Um, we understand um, all of us that are involved in this um, how much pressure there can be. Uh, in order to come up with a quick decision or a quick solution or a quick way to protect a cemetery uh, or a burial site. Uh, but uh, by careful documentation, uh, careful field investigation, and as I pointed out, even the um, kind of preliminary note taking that you can do uh, on foot, uh, you, can, you can begin to build a careful strategy because many times this, these take uh, years um, in order to uh, preserve and get a handle on them. But without this uh, uh, kind of overlapping documentation of context, airship, and ownership, uh, it makes your, uh, uh, your work even more difficult. Uh, so uh, I would just urge you to be careful uh, uh, 
be be complete and thorough and uh, overlap your strategies uh, for this work. Uh, thank you, uh, Mary, and um, I'll turn it back to you. Thank you so very much, Everett. We appreciate your expertise today. Um, we are going to transition over to our question and answer period within this webinar. I, I'd also like to note that through the Q&A session, we will be joined by Simeon A. Warren, who is the Chief of Architecture and Engineering with the National Center for Preservation Technology and Training uh, with the National Park Service to provide a little bit of biography. Uh, he brings a wealth of knowledge and experience uh, to the NCPTP in trade education, building construction, and environmental art practice. Uh, he is a trained cathedral stone carver, sculptor, conservator, and environmental artist, and was part of the formative team that developed the School of Building Arts, which became the American College of the Building Arts in 2005. He was the founding dean of the college and helped develop the college's interdisciplinary program that integrates trade and liberal arts education alongside the line fields in preservation, architecture, and building design. We'll also be joined by all of our other panelists. Uh, we ask that, you know, as our panelists answer questions, uh, that they uh, turn their cameras on uh, so that everyone can see them in the webinar. And without further ado, I can jump into some of the Q&A. We have quite a few questions uh, for our panelists today. Uh, starting out, uh, we have a question from Billy Follinsby. Is there a list of which offices or sources to contact and or consult in each state uh, where people can find out who owns or legally controls cemeteries? I often get questions from people who want me or my students to assist with the conservation of a rural forgotten cemetery near them, but they do not know who owns it and cannot afford to hire a lawyer to find out for them. My university will not allow us to work there unless we have express permission from the owners or legal caretakers of the cemetery. If any of our panelists would like to chime in. Hi, this is Chris Cody and I'm happy to chime in. I know that Everett also touched on this, um, but you know, really the best way to tell is to start with a, a thorough examination of the title and usually the, usually the local uh, property records office or recorder, you know, there are a lot of different names for them, can help you with uh, accessing that information. That's the best place to start. Thank you, Chris. Would anyone else like to chime in? All right. Um, we have a question from Ann Brockett, which is, can an owner deny access to descendants, uh, whether or not there is an easement attached to the deed? Well, I'm happy to, to jump back in and answer this one as well. Um, you know, it, my general answer is that it depends on, on your jurisdiction. I think you heard me say it differs from state to state repeatedly um, during my presentation. But, you know, as I also said, in general, descendants do have um, an inherent right to access the burial places of their descendants, although, uh, or of their ancestors, pardon me, although the owner of the property is permitted to place uh, reasonable restrictions on that access, depending again on, on the local jurisdiction. Now, if, um, you know, to the deg degree to which uh, relation is required um, for an easement in gross to be implied uh, usually depends on the specific local laws. I've even uh, in my research seen some jurisdictions that create an implied easement in gross even for those pursu pursuing genealogical research in uh, privately owned burial places and cemeteries. So there's a lot of variation. Yeah, that variation seems to be something of a theme when it comes to ownership and access. Um, we have several more questions related to ownership and titles, but to shift over slightly, um, we have a question from Ann Cuss that says, how does NAGPRA impact in uh, in our HP listed archeological site connected to a federally unrecognized Native American tribe. What rights and resources impact heritage management for these groups? Uh, 
Uh, just to read that again, uh, how does NAGPRA impact an NRHP listed archaeological site connected to a federally unrecognized Native American tribe? What rights and resources impact heritage management for these groups? Well, thank you for rereading that question. I'll jump back in and just say that that is a very complicated question, especially given the unrecognized status of the tribe. Um, you know, I would really encourage you to refer that very specific question to the, the National Park Service and to their NAG for program, which they administer um, as, as for the specific best practices. I, I, I wish I, I knew the exact correct answer and I don't wanna risk giving saying something that's wrong. Um, you know, my gut instinct is that uh, given that it's a national register site or listed site um, and, you know, the protections of NAGPRA, that uh, any objects should fall under the protections of NAGPRA. Um, but for exactly how that then interfaces with an unrecognized tribe is not a specific area that, that I'm familiar with. Um, I would hope that because of the involvement of Section 106, that the State Historic Preservation Officer would also have um, some say in ensuring that uh, the responsibilities of the uh, actor under NAGPRA were fully respected. Thank you so much, Chris. Uh, we have a question for Pam. Uh, the African American Burial Grounds Protection Program was written to receive funding in fiscal year 2023. Since we know that's not happened until fiscal year 2024, will the funding be extended so it will indeed go for five years? Uh, regardless of when first year funding begins. Thanks. Yeah, that's a really good question. Um, there's actually a, a line written into the legislation uh, that basically says um, if there's any money that does not get spent in a particular fiscal year, it'll be available for subsequent fiscal years. So what that means is while we're in fiscal year 2023, a lot of that time is ticking down while we're waiting for Congress to go through the appropriations process. But what will happen is the money for fiscal year 2023 will be available in the future and it's not lost money. Um, so that money will still be able to, to be a part of the grant program. Uh, thank you. Uh, what, what do you see as the biggest obstacles for legislation moving forward regarding burial site preservation? Um, Currently, this has been one of the two bills the National Trust has been focused on related to some of the issues that we've been talking about on the webinar today. And thankfully, we had the big legislative win back in December 2022 that got this legislation enacted. And I think uh, the hurdle that we face on this uh, issue now is just uh, waiting for Congress to go through the appropriate steps uh, for the appropriation cycle. I think, as I mentioned, we've seen um, some good indications so far that there's been support in the president's budget for having the full um, $3 million for the first year, uh, and also already letters on Capitol Hill that have signaled support uh, to the Appropriations Committee. So I definitely encourage all of you to use some of the National Trust appropriations resources and keep the drumbeat going and the momentum um, on support for this funding. Uh, we'll need to show that support um, every year to make sure that Congress appropriates the full amount. Absolutely. Thank you so much, Pam. Uh, we have a question have from a John question. Allen. Uh, if a historic burial ground is not a, quote, contributing element to, but lies within an historic district, is it protected by federal law? So that question is, is if if an historic building ground is not a contributing element to, but lies within a historic district, is it protected by federal law? Um, I, I'm happy to answer that one. Uh, if it is not recognized as a contributing element of that historic district, then it is not considered a historic resource for the purposes of federal law. I think the question is, uh, oh yes, yes, it's not a contributing element. Uh, yeah, thank you. Um, let's see, uh, we have a question from Tanya DeBose. Uh, in Texas, there's a bill to allow disinterment without notification to descendants. Where can we find federal legislation to help us advocate for public notice? I think we'd also extend that question, you know, what other resources uh, might be available to address this issue? Just 
to repeat that uh, in Texas, there's a bill to allow disinterment without notification to descendants. Where can we find uh, federal legislation or other resources to help us advocate for public notice? Hi, this is Pam. Um, I can just say briefly, um, at the National Trust and our Government Relations Department, we're primarily focused on federal legislation. Um, I, I can't think of anything off the top of my head specifically related to that issue with pending legislation, um, but I am happy to put my um, email address in the chat. And if you'd like to reach out to me directly, I can I can take a look. And I can add to that answer that, um, and there was actually a great comment in the webinar chat after my, my last uh, answer about NAGPRA and private lands, um, it, that you know generally NAGPRA does not uh, apply to private lands. However, um, if there's a state bill that would, I'm just imagining, guessing, change or eliminate the notice requirement within state statute um, for disinterment, the federal NAGPRA uh, requirements still exist, and there can be other hooks for NAGPRA to apply, such as the use of federal funding or the granting of a federal permit for a project, um, even if it's conducted on private land. Thank you. Uh, we have a question from Joseph Latshaw. What are ways to approach uh, like getting a professional survey of a cemetery with limited funds? And Joseph, I will say that our third webinar uh, will focus on strategies for fundraising, uh, especially towards preservation. So that's certainly something that we'll be able to talk about further in future parts of this series. Uh, but if anyone else would like to contribute to his to answering his question. So Mary, I'll, I'll start. Uh, <laughs> seems like I've had quite a, a few opportunities to, to work with that. Um, one of the things that I've observed in working with the, uh, the professional surveyors is, again, if you can provide some background information, um, you know, every, like show you the, the meets and bounds description, um, uh, you can look for um, old U.S. geological survey maps, um, you know, any, any kind of advanced footwork that you can do um, helps your case in um, uh, approaching a surveyor. Uh, so that survey that I showed in my uh, little slide uh, deck, um, we were able to get the surveyor to um, uh, donate his services because we had done that, uh, you know, early footwork. In other words, he did not have to go out and find that boundary description. Uh, we found surrounding um, uh, uh, property maps, et cetera. So we gave him a really big head start. Um, there, there are also, um, uh, we were able to get um, uh, different advanced uh, university classes to uh, work with the civil engineering uh, can, again, uh, a lot of times help civil engineering students need field projects. Um, uh, geologic engineering students need field projects. And then there are also, uh, we've come across um, uh, kind of uh, uh, community service uh, groups, uh, you know, whether they be uh, archaeologists or, or uh, civil engineers or uh, civil engineering professional groups, associations. Uh, a lot of times they have folks that are looking for uh, community service work. Um, so it might seem challenging, but, uh, you know, those are techniques that, that I've used and have had pretty good success. Thank you so much. Uh, we have a question from Kelly Christopher. Uh, where there isn't a clearly defined owner of a cemetery and the owner is an organization that hasn't existed since the 1940s, are the, is there any suggestions or way to move in a direction to change ownership of the cemetery to preserve it from encroachment of the residential neighborhood built around it. So it's a, a cemetery without a clearly defined owner. Um, if there are any recommendations on that. Well, I'll, I'll go ahead and jump in again. Man, these are some really tough questions, but you know, I think as we're discovering with cemeteries and burial sites, that uh, it's always complex and it's always variable and uh, you know, not easy. So, with the case of you know there being no identified owner, I would want to know who the owner of the underlying parcel of land is. 
and what their intentions are. I think I described the uh, um, the Virginia's process, at least for how remains could be relocated from an abandoned cemetery, but whether uh, this place meets the definition of abandoned in that local jurisdictions uh, laws is, you know, one question, what the owner wants to do with the land and, you know, the degree to which you can affect that decision making process uh, under your local jurisdiction is, is another question. And, you know, then from there, uh, if you're able to um, have the owner of the parcel agree to allow um, an organization to have some kind of ownership interest, be it uh, the easement and gross, as I described, or you know, even fee simple ownership to try and protect it. You know, that's something um, that could then lead to an organization being able to to preserve it. Uh, in regards to um, having to deal with the development around it, I did bring up the example of the um, cemetery outside of Charleston, South Carolina, where you know, if you think that the boundaries of this cemetery don't include all of the potential burials, that's a very important thing um, to note. For, uh, and to inform the developer and any relevant state and local officials about. Thank you. Uh, Yolanda Boyd has a question about uh, whether or not enslaved, cemeteries for enslaved people will fall under HR 6805 section 3667. Uh, and which is the African American Burial Grounds Preservation Act, whether or not cemeteries for enslaved people will fall under that protection. Sorry, I missed the first part. Um, the short answer is that um, written into the legislation, there's a finding section at the top that describes some of the history uh, and reasoning for the bill, and it specifically mentions uh, slave burial grounds. Um, and that's certainly one of the topics and issues that as the National Park Service is kind of building out the program criteria for the grant program. Um, they'll do some work around what types of um, sites would be included. Great, and I know uh, on the National Trust end, uh, there's been some activity of the African American Cultural Heritage Action Fund um, in support of uh, the bill. So that's very exciting to see, you know, increasing support for um, through legislation and funding. Um, next up, uh, we have, um, let's see, uh, what are the access rights if the gravestones, if gravestones have been relocated to another site, uh, but the graves have not been moved? Access if gravestones have been removed from a burial ground, but the graves have not been moved. Uh, well, I hate to sound like a broken record, but it it depends on jurisdiction to jurisdiction. Um, you know, I, I think it also depends on the nature of the gravestones or markers. Uh, you know, usually the burial site itself and the remains are what is contemplated by the law in terms of providing an implied easement and gross but I don't want to exclude the possibility that in some places uh, objects associated with that burial place are similarly uh, similarly can provide an implied easement and gross as well. So it depends yeah. is again my final answer. Understood. Uh, Simi, I think this will be a good question for you. A uh, question from Paul Smith. We took over a cemetery with a stack of broken headstones. With little to no record of where they go, what is a common resolve for this type of situation? And what do we do with all the broken headstones? Yeah, so, uh, you know, it's not uncommon that uh, stones are moved. Uh, and uh, obviously, uh, it's very hard and difficult to uh, know exactly where they lie unless uh, there were original maps. Uh, a lot of churches have original maps that uh, you can kind of find. Uh, if you can find those, then you can kind of re, re, reposition those back to their uh, original um, sites. In terms of uh, 
you know, uh, mending stones. Uh, we have at NCPT developed a page uh, on our uh, on the website for MPS, uh, an area that uh, you know talks about a lot of areas of of uh, mending monuments. Um, and uh, so, I don't know whether someone can put that in chat uh, uh, while while we talk, but uh, that's a good resource to kind of look at how how to uh, mend monuments and how to clean monuments. Um, and again, I think with stone, uh, it really depends on what the damage is. Um, there's many different types of repair. Uh, sometimes the simplest thing um, is the easiest thing. Uh, and also, uh, I think people need to remember that stone has been around for a long time and it takes a long time for stone to decay generally. So kind of wade in to think uh, loudly about kind of what your objectives are and also going to, if it's a complicated thing, actually go in and investigate in what the best methods are and if there's anyone local that does the kind of work that you kind of need. Again, it's really specific to what the damage is and how the stones are kind of broken and how they go back together. And so, you know, I've done the last 30 years, uh, I've been kind of working with stone and every time I find a, a new stone, it's there's always a new way to do something. So uh, uh, it really depends on on what that damage is and what that stone is. And I do know that we'll be doing some of that uh, uh, kind of uh, um, those conversations in the next uh, programs coming up. Uh, I think the third program is kind of about where to start with some of the physical kind of uh, work. And so um, uh, that, that you have to kind of tune in again to uh, uh, find out some of those methods and methodologies. I'd add to that the importance of reaching out to families when able, uh, maybe something that they would be interested in, in retaining themselves. Um, also, Simeon, we have someone vying for a position within the NCPTT in the chat. So if you have uh, any recommendations for where they can look about internships or job openings, they appreciate it. Yeah, uh, I mean, uh, we're a government agency, so if job openings, we we have a new landscape position coming up for NCPTT pretty soon. Uh, that's probably be, uh, in fall when that comes out. Um, but also, we we do do internships, uh, and a lot of those are kind of uh, um, uh, done uh, as a part of our projects, and so kind of getting in touch with the departments that you're interested in and finding out what opportunities uh, are available. It's probably the best way to do it is actually get in touch with those department heads and uh, uh, seeing what opportunities are, are coming up and uh, going out, out there, so. Everett, we have a question directly for you. Uh, this is from Tanya DeBose. Uh, Mr. Fly has worked with many of our historic black towns and settlements to help identify historical and cultural resources. However, it's surprising that cemeteries are not automatically protected. Can you expound on any work that you're doing to assist people dealing with enslaved burial sites? Uh, well, th thank you, Tanya, for the uh, for the question. Um, uh, just in, in my work with the with the communities, um, I consider the the burial sites integral parts of the communities, and so I'm I'm always looking you know, as a whole, you know, the burial site, the church site, the school site, the residential sites, et cetera. Um, and I, I see them as, uh, as inseparable, uh, you know, from that, um, that whole picture of preservation. Um, and I, I'll say real quick, I think Simeon gave you a good uh, guidance in that previous question about the, uh, the gravestones, but um, I'm also, uh, very concerned about, uh, you know, retaining the authenticity of the sites. So removing uh, uh, fragments and artifacts and that kind of thing. I think it, if, if there's any way that they can be retained on site until you, uh, that's what I was getting at when I say you figure out your strategy and, um, you know, advance your research. Um, I think it would be, uh, you know, really important, but uh, the, the burial sites in historic black communities are are, are very important. And in many cases, uh, the, the only authentic uh, representation of that uh, culture uh, and that community. 
Absolutely. Uh, this is a question from Tom Bradshaw. We also have another issue with the closure of churches and some have graveyards on their property. When they're sold and become private property, how can we ensure that there's access to our loved one, uh, our loved ones that have been buried there? So this is access to a uh, burial site um, following the closure and sale of a church. Well, not, not hearing anyone else jumping in, I'll, I'll go ahead and weigh in again that um, you know, even if the church closes, all of the uh, laws, again, the applied uh, access easement for the cemetery um, will still exist for descendants, but also um, one other uh, group that can enjoy those implied easements are groups with a demonstrated interest in, in the cemetery. Yeah, thank you. Uh, and just to note, we're going to have only a few more uh, minutes for question and answers, uh, but I will be able to get to one or two more. Um, do most historic cemetery designations follow the 50 year rule as structures or are some places uh, designating cultural landmark status to cemeteries? This question comes from Jack Lynch. Um, again, again, I'll, I'll just go ahead and jump in here, although I'd, I'd love to hear Mr. Mr. Fly's perspective as well. Um, most of them that I have seen recorded are recorded as uh, above ground resources, similar to other built environment resources on the National Register. However, the criteria under which cemeteries are listed are often, uh, you know, different from built environment. Um, notably associations with uh, famous people or um, episodes in American history are, I think, I believe are more frequently cited with cemeteries than they are for buildings, which primarily come in through architectural merit or contribution to an architectural district. Uh, the idea of, of them being designated as sort of a cultural landscape or some sort of traditional cultural property is an intriguing one. Um, I'm just more familiar with their inclusion on National Register inventories um, in the same vein as built environment resources, but you know, it's, it's an interesting idea to think about them, uh, probably an appropriate one, as cultural landscapes as much as, as any kind of building. Uh, Mary, uh, yes, I would, I would definitely agree with uh, Chris, um, you know, his interpretation and uh, this is kind of what I was touching on, uh, you know, when I was talking about, uh, you know, building the history of the, the, you know, the congregation, the culture and the people, um, excuse me, associated with it. Um, so, um, you know, I'm like, like Chris said earlier, you know, each place is a little bit different. Um, and, and so I would tell the, the uh, person that asked the question, you know, do not automatically rule it out. Uh, and again, that's where that uh, extended community genealogy would would come into play, uh, you know, to see, um, you know, what the what the network of culture and history is related to that uh, to that site, and uh, you know, even you, you know the physical form. Uh, again, the orientation, uh, uh, the way the graves are laid out, uh, you know, even the natural landscaping could be. Um, a contributing factor to you know building your your case uh, you know for significance. Thanks. Yeah, thank y'all. Um, and I will also note that we've gotten several questions about some fundraising uh, for cemetery preservation. I always encourage y'all to look at the funding opportunities that are offered by the National Trust. Um, there are many more out there, and we'll have the. Uh, opportunity to speak further about that subject matter in our third webinar um, in the series in June, uh, looking at different fundraising strategies and opportunities. 
Uh, but otherwise, uh, this is the end of our question and answer period. Unfortunately, we don't have more time for y'all today. Uh, but this recording will be sent out uh, to all registrants uh, of the uh, program. Uh, if you'll go to the next slide, please. Uh, yep, yeah, as I mentioned, uh, for upcoming web webinars, we're going to be looking at uh, investi investigating, documenting, preserving grave sites on May 10th, uh, and all of the various elements for beginning to care for a grave site, including fundraising, uh, preservation interpretation uh, on June 21st. Uh, we're very excited to be talking with y'all about those different areas. Next slide, please. And, you know, we encourage y'all to visit our website, forum.savingplaces.org, look out for other webinars, uh, and to view the uh, webinar archives, which will include this uh, recording as well, uh, beyond its e it being sent out over email. Uh, please feel free to contact us at forumonline at savingplaces.org. Uh, and just join me in thanking our panelists and the wonderful information that y'all were able to share with us today. Um, and I hope that all of our participants had a have a wonderful rest your day. Thank you so much for joining us.